Okay, so our goal is to equip and empower. We don't want handouts. We don't want to just go to a community and say, okay, here's 10 free bags of maize, here's 10 free bags of fertilizer. We want to come in with solutions that are sustainable. Welcome to Impact Investing TV. Together, we will go on a global adventure, discovering the power of impact investing. You will meet inspiring humans who are shaping a sustainable world for current and future generations. There's no limit to the positive changes when we come together. Let's the journey begin. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode six of season seven. To all of those who are joining in for the first time in this season, the theme is Impact Investing Worldwide, Uniting for a Sustainable Future. Today, we are going to talk of food production and agriculture. The topic is nurturing the soil and soul of Africa. As the climate change speeds up, we are seeing the collapse of food systems around the world. Added to that, food production is also one of the most carbon-intensive ones. Especially production of cattle feed is devastating primal forest and replacing indigenous horticulture. The issue is that agriculture and climate change are very much interrelated. What a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Even if we ignore the fact that our Russian friends unknowingly and deliberately destroying one of the world's major food producer, Ukraine. Can you name a few of the impacts of climate change on food production? Sure. Uh, maybe just a few of the points which has very recently been on the news. India, one of the world's largest rice producer, recently stopped exporting rice. World's coffee production has fallen also considerably. Only this year, the yield is 15% lower than normal. And in sub-Saharan Africa, where the main diet is wheat, maize, sorghum, and millet, a rise of less than 2% will cause yield to drop by 10%. And more than 2% will cause a drop of 20%. And add to that the expanding population. Right. Remember to look at it from the other side. Our present way of agriculture is having a huge impact on climate change, right? And if we continue with our present way of world food system, then in the next 80 years, it will have produced, listen carefully, 1.4 trillion metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And just for your information, viewers, growing one apple produces 12 grams of GSG. Compare that with only 75 gram of beef, which gives out nearly three kilos of greenhouse gas emissions. And such huge difference is valid for many fruits and vegetables. So time to think to become vegan, vegetarian, or at least flexitarian with very little meat consumption. And so now let's see a little video and so our audience can guess where our guests of today are coming from. Right. Can you guess now? No, let the guests, let the viewers <laughs> guess themselves. <laughs> All right. All right. With this, I'd like to invite our guests of today, Denise Madiro and Gwen Jones. 
Good day, good afternoon, ladies. Welcome to Swiss Impact with Benergies. Good afternoon. So where are you two based at this moment? I'm based in Johannesburg in South Africa. And I'm streaming in from San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> wow, two parts of the world. That's fantastic. And we are in the middle between you guys in Switzerland. <laughs> All right, let me introduce you quickly to our audience. So I start with you, Denise. Denise is a renowned entrepreneur of international stature with experience in running and building rapidly expanding businesses in Zimbabwe, Zambia, and South Africa. You, Denise, also ensure products meet international standards and certifications. And also, you focus on the capacity development to enhance skills of small and medium enterprises. You are running your daily life as a chief operation officer at a company in Zatu. And I will tell more about it in a few minutes. So welcome, Denise. Great to have you with us. And now, Gwen, about you, you are very well experienced with 25 years of experience and proven track record of creating commercially viable projects with operational experience in United States, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Switzerland. You're also advisory board member of the World Food Bank. You have created a trust task with tribal empowerment and livelihood programs also support activities related to agribusinesses and rural development. And you are the Chief Partnership Officer at Zatu. So great to have you with us as well, Gwen. Welcome. And maybe very few words about Zatu before we start. So to get some light shed on the company itself. So Zatu is a nature-based solution for biodiversity protection and climate change mitigation. It cultivates a, gen a regenerative agriculture model that works to produce sustainable food without interfering with natural resources and preserving wildlife habitat. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> and so this we want to start. So Denise and Gwen, can you tell us a bit about your story and how did you come to Nazatu? Okay, I think I'll go first. Um, as you explained, thank you so much for having us on your show today. We really are excited and looking forward to this session. Um, I'm actually, uh, I think it's good that I mentioned my background. I was born in rural Zambia on the banks of the Kafui River, which is actually adjacent to the Kafui National Park. So we had the privilege of growing up a very tact tactful life where, um, you know, it was very organic and natural. We didn't need much or want much. But at the same time, um, this is why we're holding Zatu so close to our hearts, is that we are able to identify with the challenges that the rural communities face. And this is how Nzatu was born, is because we wanted to find a way that we could uplift the communities. And how best could we do that was to create a bridge between what the farmers are producing and the direct linkage to the market. So that is how Nzatu was born. And um, that's a little bit, you know, um, of my story. Thank you. And Gwen, how about you? Yes, just to expand on that. Um, so our roots are in a dual heritage. Our father was British and our mother indigenous tribal. Um, this gave us an immense bifocal lens, which gave us a deep understanding of the duality of these situations, having our roots in a, a strong cultural heritage while living adjacent to the Kafui National Park we grew up with a national park right in our backyard. And as children, we would often just go for an evening drive and, and view giraffes and lechwe right behind us. And we took it so for granted, but that exposure helped us to really have an inherent um, connection with wildlife and conservation, and then the cultural connection as well. And growing up, we would see how the market linkages truly affected our communities around us. And as we matured and became to understand it better, it gave birth to the vision for Inzatu because we started helping our families in terms of helping them to be more productive, beekeeping activities so that they could have additional incomes. 
And that informal practice gave birth to our corporate identity of Inzatu. Inzatu, um, as you may know, means ours in our local language. And it's ours for our producers and ours for the consumers. So through Inzatu, we create this bridge of our products to get to market. That's so amazing when the roots of true impact entrepreneurs are coming from their roots, you know, and I've seen so many because then you're truly passionate about what you're doing to create positive impact. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Exactly. And in case yeah. you have not guessed, both of them are sisters. <laughs> so <laughs> You look very similar, almost <laughs> and, like twins. And, 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 and the best is when I was a small kid, I used to read Tarzan. And, and you come really with that background that in the nat natural park behind you, growing up there, living there, that's like an ideal dream world growing up for kids. Yeah. So with that, I'd like to ask the next question. So in your opinion, which sector do you believe holds the most potential for growth and innovation in Africa in the next coming decades? I personally believe it's got to be agriculture. In Africa, we have almost the perfect conditions um, to grow produce. You know, we have such good weather conditions and good um, rainfall and also accessibility to land. But I also want to add to that is that um, beekeeping is presenting a very good um, opportunity, you know, in the African agriculture development um, because there's such a big uh, demand that is growing at the moment globally for honey. And as you're aware, honey is basically used, um, you know, a, a lot in pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. And it's also, uh, you know, for they use it for a base for cough mixture. And also the byproduct of the beeswax is used for um, cosmetics. And of course, it's also become such a um, good alternative to sugar. So a lot of people are looking at, you know, the health conscious side of it where they, um, you know, are using honey as an alternative. And we're also finding that um, a lot of chefs are experimenting, you know, with pastries, artisanal chefs, and incorporating, you know, honey into all these amazing type of recipes. So definitely the, globally, there's a huge demand for, for, for honey. And, um, you know, just in the time that we've been working with Inzatu, we have seen, um, you know, that this could actually be an upliftment for entire country. It could be a source of foreign currency as well. So not only are we going to be able to uplift the communities, but we can certainly make an impact even, you know, nation uh, on a national basis. Can you name maybe the products which Nzatu is involved in? What are beside honey that you mentioned now? Yes. So um, just, uh, you know, in our introduction, we were talking about how we came up with um, forming Nzatu is that, uh, you know, we came across a need to say, OK, there's also this beautiful product of coffee. How can we incorporate coffee into our program? And um, we narrowed it down to just coffee and honey for a start. But eventually, as we grow, we would like to also, you know, incorporate other products. So at the moment, Nzatu is just focusing on coffee and um, honey. And um, I think Winnie can also touch on the other opportunity that has also just come about recently on the seaweed. That's great. And uh, maybe a question to Gwen. What's your approach to genuine community involvement in global projects that Zatu is also supporting? Yes, um, <clears throat> genuine involvement is a good phrase. A few years ago, when we started our involvement in coffee, I was working on a project in Kenya and we were trying to analyze why was the coffee sector down by 66%. And as we did our research and studied the sector nationwide, we came to understand that there was one key disconnect in terms of coffee production. Kenya, as you know, was a British colony. And culturally, Kenyans drink tea. They don't drink coffee. So we had to find a way. How can we connect this beautiful cash crop of Kenya to the culture of the people of Kenya? So we studied. And lo and behold, we used the Mursik, which is traditionally uh, drunk in most uh, traditional communities across the world, in Zambia, in India, in Kenya, Somalia. Most indigenous communities have this sour milk as like a probiotic drink. So mm -hmm. we took Mersic, which is 
familiarly known in Kenya as drink of champions. And it's often given to the Olympic runners when they come home from winning gold medals, it's given to them at the airport. So we decided this would be a really good brand connection to introduce the taste of coffee. And we mixed the Mersic with coffee and honey and the elders in the village would be drinking coffee for the first time and their eyes would light up. That might be wrong. <laughs> oh, coffee, no, you're awake now. Huh? <laughs> right. So we realized that uh, that simple connection helped us to then introduce other techniques of improving soil quality, conservation. It's important to bring that link to communities. Historically, they always uh, grew cash crops without understanding the value of the crop. And I think it's so important to, to give honor and dignity to our communities by finding that connect. And that's what uh, Inzato is all about, is mm -hmm. because Denise and I come from that cultural um, heritage, we're able to bring that cultural voice, even if we don't, even if far away from Zambia, we don't speak that language, we always find a way to connect from that point of view. Mm. Thank you. But to do this, you also need to training. So how do you tailor training and curriculum to ensure both that the local relevance and also for international certification? Sure. Um, training is something that I'm actually very passionate about. Um, and I just also want to mention is that beekeeping has been practiced for centuries you know, even in, you know, back to our ancestors, because we actually see this on rock paintings where you actually see, you know, there's the painting of a bee. So it tells you that this practice has been there for many years. However, when we come in to offer the training, we come in more as a support. We, you know, we want to understand what are the challenges that the communities are facing? Okay, so you're doing beekeeping. What is the method that you're using? And in that method, maybe they're using a basket weave, which is a traditional method. So we don't say you are doing this the wrong way, but we come into support and say, okay, if you're using this method, how about you improve the, te the technique and we give you a double volume, you know, uh, type of a bee box that will increase the quality of your honey and your yield. So we come in with support measures by understanding first and foremost, what are the challenges that they have? And then also what we also do is that when we do training like the slide that was just shown there. I was training 450 um, youth that come from vulnerable backgrounds. And you know, in Africa, when I talk about vulnerable, we're talking about abusive um, uh, you know, marriages or children that have been abused and alcoholics you know, as parents. So when I was doing this training for this particular group, I wanted to bring in the message of biodiversity and conservation, but in a fun way. So we decided that the best way we could tailor this particular program was to make some candles from beeswax. So what we did, we actually strained the, the, the um, wax from the comb and after we heated it up and we also used cow dung. I'm not sure if you, if you know that that is a way that you can create fuel. So the message is to say, don't cut down a tree to burn, you know, your, 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 um, to heat up your wax. So we actually have the message from grassroots to explain that we're going to use type of methods. So we heated up the wax and we created these beautiful candles. They could not believe, one, that, you know, they could go home with a candle to create light. And secondly, that they'll be able to sell these candles to buy books and uniforms. And um, so we do tailor, you know, it depends on which group, which community that we are, that we are dealing with. And also, um, we're very mindful as we we're explaining, one of the benefits that we have is that we understand cultural um, protocol. So when we come in, we appreciate the men of the home and we don't want to be seen as us overriding. So there are certain ways that we do it where we then bring in the, the, the coffee training together with the beekeeping and then the candle making. That way, we show that we are actually um, building a family unit together to uprise, as opposed to say, we are only uplifting the women or the children. So in that slide, we also have um, our coffee experts from Italy that come in to advise the farmers how best they can improve the quality from a point where they actually process it. So they come in and you know tell the farmers what not to do, what they look out for. So we really have a very 
holistic approach to how we do our training. And in that, we are then able to have the certification done according to the standards, international standards. And um, yeah, so we, we come in and look at the whole picture and it's tailored case by case. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, but let's go to the bigger picture on Nzatu for our audience to understand. So what is the mission and the goals of Nzatu? Okay, so our goal is to equip and empower. We don't want handouts. We don't want to just go to a community and say, okay, here's 10 free bags of maize, here's 10 free bags of fertilizer. We want to come in with solutions that are sustainable. We want to come in with solutions where a family is able to create an income or generate an income from the beginning of the year until the end of the year. And we realize that through the intercropping, the agroforestry and the beekeeping. So we always demonstrate matrices. We say, OK, if you're only going to sell a bag of maize, you're only going to get 20 cents per kg. However, if you incorporate beekeeping, you're going to get $150. And then in month four, you're going to harvest your sweet potatoes. And then in month six, your, your bee box is ready to produce some more honey. And then in your last month, you can now get fruit from your avocado or fruit from your mango. So we demonstrate a sustainable um, way that, the, that you know, the families can earn that income throughout the year. Wow. And, and how can agroforestry ensure enhanced food security and correct economic imbalances? Yes, agroforestry is extremely important in Africa and all around the world, but in particular to address our deforestation. As you know, we have severe energy poverty in Africa. So the forests are a threat because it's used for fuel to fuel residences. So what we do in our training is we incorporate trees that offer profitable agroforestry. Yes, we've worked with Glaricidia and other trees that are really this, just there as a nitrate fixing for the soil. But we go a step further and we research trees that can offer food, feed and fuel in terms of biofuel. So it's, it's a very conscious decision that we've chosen the suite of trees to use to intercrop in our coffee. As you know, coffee loves shade, it's shade tolerant. So we incorporate those profitable trees within the coffee groves. This not only fixes nitrogen in the soils, creating a better biodiversity in the area, but also gives different food crops that um, can be used as additional in revenue streams. We're always conscious is what is the intervention we can bring here? Will it offer another income? Will it help the environment? How will it help to improve the livelihood of the communities we are working with? So this is where agroforestry is extremely useful. Thank you. Wow, that uh, was a very nice insight. I, I have another question to you, ladies. How do you address food security, which is so important nowadays in the global challenge? And how do you make uh, crop diversification in the face of climate change? Yes, added to that, added to the profitable agroforestry, we look at um, the food culture of Africa. You know, Africa's indigenous crops um, have very high nutritional. Mm -hmm. We have 26 traditional grains of Africa that are not as popular now today and have been phased out we are working to reintroduce those traditional cereals. They are drought tolerant, high in nutritional value. Barley and sorghum are some of the highest nutritional content cereals in the world. And we are bringing those back. Of course, communities have become accustomed to maize, but maize only offers 3% nutritional content. And whenever we try and encourage our communities to switch to sorghum, they're not familiar with the taste. We ourselves, Denise and I, have <laughs> tried also to say, we, if we are training our communities to eat sorghum and millet, it must start with ourselves. So, but you know. Absolutely, our own example is the best. <laughs> yes, and it's a very hard to break. So when we bring in cow peas and, and different higher nutritional value crops, we start off with recipe days. We demonstrate 
how can you incorporate this in your daily cuisine so that the communities become accustomed you know through those different recipes for example do you know that with cowpeas which is is a legume and nitrogen fixing and drought tolerant it has so many properties you can use the roots for a beverage the leaves for a relish the actual cowpeas you can make in a relish and you can use it to make flour um mm -hmm. to make, uh, cookies and different mm -hmm. um snacks it, it's just wonderful to train on different ways that you can use cowpeas so we get really excited about that and now I'm getting, Are you also excited? I'm hungry. hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how is your approaching making a difference in the lives of the smallhold farmers in sub-Saharan? Because many of the farmers, the majority, are smallhold. Our approach, um, what we like to do, okay, firstly, I just want to mention is that with our conservation partners, we like to, we actually tap into the same network so in Uganda, what happened is that six years ago, the Lawrence Anthony Earth Organization um, sponsored, I think, about 10,000 plants, coffee plants as a way to conserve the environment. And six years later, um, you know, we came along, we came on board and uh, wanted to incorporate the, the beekeeping into that program. And, you know, when we went back, we actually seen the difference. There's actually a slide. Um, where you see a farmer's house six years ago, what it looked like, and how his life has been improved in just a period of six years. So we are able to see that our families, um, you know, the communities here are keeping the children in school, sending their children to university. They are able to buy um, solar panels for electricity. So you can actually see um, the direct impact, literally in a period of six years, there's a complete transformation and very proudly so, as you can see, the farmer standing to his mansion. <laughs> wow, that's so amazing when you can see like before and after, right? The pictures. <laughs> and, and how do you ensure that your products are certified and traceable? We work very closely with the um, government institutes and um, together with the extension officers, they continue to visit the farmers to make sure that they are, you know, practicing the right methods uh, with the regenerative um, uh, practices. And through that, every product before it's exported, it has to be tested through the labor laboratories. And at the same time, some phytosanitary certificates are issued, which is the minimum required requirement for any export you know, to take place. So, you know, we have support, like I said, together with the government institu institutions, we're not just operating alone. So we also look at, you know, we take that as our partnership and we ensure that, you know, the products are meeting the international standards and certification. Mm -hmm. That's uh, amazing. It looks like Zatu has built complete ecosystem. Can you explain how it integrates various aspects of the business from soil science to marketing and branding? Sure. So from the soil science point of view, very recently now, we, we've actually partnered up with um, uh, a company that is going to work together with us to turn the waste of the coffee um, from... So in the ratio is 50-50. You get your coffee bean is 50% of, of, of the weight and the other 50% is the byproduct. So normally what happens is that the waste of the coffee, the husk, is put back into the soil as an agri you know, as a fertilizer. But sadly, because you know, the farmers have to transport their goods about 300 kilometers to the nearest processing plant, they're not going to pay um, money for the byproduct, which is the husk, to come back. So they're losing out on that value. So together with the with the soil specialists, we're now going to come up with a method where we can turn that waste into biochar. And that biochar will be incorporated to be put back into the soil. And that, that's going to be another stream of income for our farmers because they can also earn some carbon credits from that. Mm -hmm. So um, this is how we, you know, we basically tie in the whole program, you know, from seed to the cup. It seems like you have thought out everything. <laughs> so how do you ensure that your partners offers farmers a fair deal? 
We are working on that. Um, there are several challenges historically that have been in place, like spot prices on coffee. And we, are, we work with selective buyers that are helping to create those fair value pricing where we are doing forward contracts. So, for example, if we set a price today and at time of harvest, the farmer will get that forward price that we offered in the contract. Historically, and in some cases, not, not everywhere, but in a lot of cases, a lot of producers have been let down because at time of harvest, the spot price is below what they planted at, at the beginning of the season, which has given them short cash value and it has given them a loss for that season. So we discuss a lot of these issues with the producers. How can we help? How can we create a more because fair price is not just fair price at purchase, but it's taking into account the whole season, taking into account of all aspects of the producer's livelihood. And we're learning. Our producers are teaching us how we can do better. We don't have all the answers right now, but as we go along, we are, we are, we are identifying the best buyers to work with who understand these challenges, who are more socially conscious. So, of course, as a business model, it is much more difficult to operate like that. But we want to be conscious of each decision we make. And fair price, fair seasonal price, there has to be a better word than fair price because, as I said, it has to capture the entire livelihood linkage and chain of the producer. So we're working on that. and and hope to come up with the best model for our producers. Yeah. Um, Denise, you also mentioned early child marriages. How does that to help alleviate problems like that? Yeah, and that's not part of your business. So mm -hmm. how do you do that as well? Yeah, it's very much part of our business, Sveta, because um, as we explained from the, our introduction is that we come from the rural community where we have seen, you know, um, personally, our friends that we used to play with that were married off, you know, uh, at early ages. So it is very much part of our business because that's what our core is, is that we want to come in with ways where we can bring in that alternative income. Because, you know, ultimately what causes the early teen marriages is um, it's the dowry. It's, it's the bride price, which is, you know, equated to a cow, which is seen as well. Mm -hmm. But if we, you know, bring in programs to the communities where they can earn an income, for example, if you plant the agroforestry aspect, if you plant a tree when a child is born, by the time that avocado tree is seven years old and the child is seven years old and starts school, that tree can sustain a child throughout school because an avocado tree produces about 200 fruit. One fruit can be sold for a dollar. That same avocado tree, you can put two bee boxes that can produce you two seasons of honey equated to 300 US dollars. So when you come in with solutions to the problem, that's how you deal with it. So it's the same thing with um, the charcoal burners. You know, when we come in and say, don't cut down a tree, put in a bee box in that tree and it's going to keep generating an income. You're going to cut down one tree to give you two bags of charcoal but put two bee boxes in that tree and you'll see how it will change your life. And I think that's where the responsibility comes in as in Zatu, is that we need to make sure that the promise that we come to say we'll create that market linkage, we should maintain that because that is where the real freedom will be, the financial freedom, and see the community will be from such support that, you know, that we talk about. That sounds so simple, you know. All, all, genius, all genius is simple. So that's really amazing what you're saying, you know. It's, hey, it all hey, needs hey, to be a consciousness shift. So, and how do you ensure both environmental conservation and socio-economical uplift for the communities? Yes, following, following on what Denise has said, one of our key upliftments is economic uh, prosperity, supporting additional revenue streams. That is the way that um, we can ensure more stable communities. Because as you know, people don't want to leave home. And if we can mm -hmm. help to 
support communities to be more stable through upliftment, bee, beekeeping, intercropping, etc. This is going to enable less stress for the farmers and allow them to stay at home. Another way that we believe that we can bring in more value, and Denise touched on that earlier, is by valorizing the waste. There's been so much waste, um, you know, from the coffee cherry. It, it, it just, they've been throwing it away or using it in some cases for fertilizer. But we want to go a step further by buying it from them to create coffee flour and flakes so that we can show that there's now an additional revenue stream to the farmers. So that, so that economic upliftment is important for us in our training, is always communicating that value of the product to, um, to the farmers and showing them the upliftment through uh, recipes in the cowpeas, using every part of the cowpea, using every part of the coffee plant, mm -hmm. the honey, every part of the honey and the byproducts, mm -hmm. every part of the agroforestry in the trees that we are giving. Once they see that entire value chain of those products, mm -hmm. it just you just see a light bulb in their eyes and that empowerment that they can actually squeeze every part of that product and extra in. Yeah. It's truly wonderful. And, yes. and, and also make money, which yeah. is yeah. most important. Absolutely. Yeah. The nature is very wise, you know, it provides a lot of things. We just don't know how to cook it, right? If you know how. <laughs> and what are, who are your main partners? Denise and Gwen, and are you looking for more partners right now? So our main partners are, like I mentioned earlier on, the Lawrence Anthony Earth Organization. Um, they, you know, we have that direct linkage with the coffee farmers. We have um, GCC, which is um, Global Conservation Corps. Um, we're also going to be working with them where we're going to put um, beehives to, you know, avoid the human life and animal conflict. Um, we also have um, Great Plains Foundation. They are um, based in Zambia, Malawi, um, I think it's Kenya. But again, we are going in with some bee boxes. But where the interesting thing is that when we... Um, harvest that honey, we're going to brand it according to the conservation sites. So when we go to the Kruger and we have honey, we're going to brand that as Kruger honey. If we get honey from certain national parts, Luangwa National Park, we're going to brand it as Luangwa um, honey. So these are our partners that we work very closely with, but you actually see how we interweave together because that's what we're all about. We're about conservation, biodiversity, and regenerative agriculture. So each one of our partners plays a role in making sure that the whole Nzatu ecosystem works and functions well. But what I could see is that all the partners you named, most of them are public or philanthropic organizations, but your product, your business is so strong. Are you also looking for funding, for example, from commercial yes. investors or organizations? Absolutely, absolutely. Private sector investment is extremely important. Because our activities are, yes, a risk mitigation, addressing climate, but innovation and investment are really the, the best ways for us to tackle these poverty issues in um, emerging markets. And here we are calling for private investors, family offices to come alongside us and help us create these market value chains. Because without that investment, we can only do so much. We can only scale so far. But with more private sector investment, we can really make a significant impact in the communities yeah. we serve. How um, much are you raising, Gwen? How we, much money do you need? Yes, our goal is 1.5 million. We believe that um, the most important part of our work is creating more value for our communities. We need better equipment machinery we need better tools and also um we are looking at eco mills uh, for washing the coffee as you know water is one of the one of the most important challenges to address in processing coffee and we are researching that with partners in south america looking at how can we use the patent to produce those that machinery in africa so that we can reduce water usage. That is key. So innovation is extremely important. 
you know, you can grow coffee all day long, but if you don't have the right investment with better equipment, we're still not making that significant dent. So we are calling on investors that believe in business, uh, social business, investment and innovation to come alongside us so that we can work at risk mitigation. So it has to be done on a tripartite level. Exactly. And what is the biggest challenge that you foresee that Nezatu might or may face in the future? I, I believe the, the challenge is a good challenge. It's an opportunity uh, more mm -hmm. than a challenge that um, it's an opportunity for global partners and ourselves to implement those solutions by reaching a wider network of farmers. But for us, it's not so much on the numbers. It's more the quality. How can we make a deeper impact? Mm -hmm. And as you heard throughout the presentation, we're always looking at more ways to, um, to expand upliftment individually. So how can we make deeper impact per farmer as we reach more farmers? So it's a wider and deeper impact. So it's an opportunity for us to, to help more farmers. Thank you. And, and are you also planning to further increase your brand presence and influence? in the international coffee market? Yes, um, definitely. You know, um, as we know, the consumers today have become more socially conscious. Uh, we are driven by purpose. We are living mm -hmm. in such a beautiful age. You know, we, we, had, we, we had the information age, we had the different ages that we've come to, and now <laughs> in the purpose age, and this is where um, Inzatu is so aligned with what consumers need. So in that way, we have a, a wonderful team, a uh, marketing team with us, that we're able to tell our story globally. And, you know, also in the most authentic way, this is, this is a start today by being transparent and open to yeah. showcase what we're doing behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's amazing. The impact. I don't know how many SDG sustainable development goals you are tackling, but I think at least five I counted. <laughs> if I can, um, all our activities cascade into the different um, SDGs. You find we'll say, okay, we're addressing water, but we're addressing poverty, um, land use, etc. You know, in, in, you know, in, in Every SDG that we address has a way of cascading to the next one and the next one. Altogether, I mean, like, for example, SDG 1 is alleviating poverty. But to be able to do that is responsible consumption, partnerships. So they're all interlinked. And uh, this is what makes our work so fulfilling. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Ladies, the time is running so quickly. It was so nice to listen to your stories. Uh, let me ask you last questions. The first is about your, how can our audience support you? So what can they do? Should they like you on social media or should they write to you if they want a partner? What should they do? Or buy your coffee and honey. <laughs> Definitely. We are looking for partners that can support us and, um, you know, there's different platforms. Um, Gwenny, which ones can we talk about? Uh, so we are active on all uh, social media platforms. And of course, when you see our coffee in the grocery store, please yeah. reach out to Zafu because it is your coffee. It's yeah. ours together. So yeah. uh, we just want to appeal to you that, um, you know, conscious choices in your products help what we do. And um, we that, that's what we believe in, and, and we hope you will believe in that too with us. Yeah, and just in closing as well, you know, um, there's a very common uh, um, word that is used in South Africa called Ubuntu. Ubuntu means yeah. I am Ubuntu, because yes. you are. Yeah, so that's what it is. I am because you are. That's wow. so true. And maybe last call to action to global audience who would like to say something you gwen or denise or boss as you wish Gwen, mm -hmm. i think we can yes. take so we appeal to the global community 
we thank you for your time and uh, for giving us your time for, to allow us to share our story. This story is not just our story. It's a story for humanity. Help us reach more people. We call on you, we appeal to you. Join us in our journey. You'll find it not only fun, you'll be fulfilled and you'll be making a difference to the communities we serve. Thank you. Cheers to that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and it's you? I said it's cheers, fine. <laughs> she also said cheers. All right, yeah. ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. I would uh, be thrilled to try the coffee and honey from uh, Nzatu. So if you ever see that or send it to us to Switzerland, we yes. would be are happy to try. Are you also selling in Switzerland? We yes. will be <laughs> we will be soon. We'll be gladly send you some honey and coffee. Thank <laughs> Perfect. You. Thank you so much. And uh, we talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye Thank for you. now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Dear viewers, with this, we finish the sixth episode of season seven. I don't know if you had a chance to see <laughs> at our nice. Uh, background in Africa full of fruits and coffee so next week we will have another inspiring guest another impactful one so thank you for watching us and you can always reach us on apply at iisolutions.ch to become the next guest yes <laughs> <laughs> bye. bye for now bye bye hey we hope you have been inspired by the remarkable stories that shape impact investing worldwide. Make sure you subscribe to our channel not to miss any future episodes. Contact us if you want to support our guests or be the next TV show guest yourself. Join the awesome impact community and invite your friends to do the same. You can find us on TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Spotify, podcast, anywhere in your favorite social media. We look forward to sharing the next episode with you. And remember, together we create a truly sustainable future.